These extracts are from Scott's Life of Napoleon Bonaparte, the final chapter. Arrived at the conclusion of this momentous narrative, the reader may be disposed to pause a moment to reflect on the character of that wonderful person on whom fortune showered so many favours in the beginning and through the middle of his career, to overwhelm its close with such deep and unwanted afflictions. The external appearance of Napoleon was not imposing at the first glance, his stature being only five foot six inches English. His person, thin in youth and somewhat corpulent in age, was rather delicate than robust in outward appearance, but cast in the mould most capable of enduring privation and fatigue. He rode ungracefully and without the command of his horse, which distinguishes a perfect cavalier, so that he showed to disadvantage when riding beside a true horseman. But he was fearless, sat firm in his seat, rode with rapidity, and was capable of enduring the exercise for a longer time than most men. We have already mentioned his indifference to the quality of his food and his power of enduring abstinence. A morsel of food and a flask of wine hung at his saddle-bow, used in his earlier campaigns to support him for days. In his latter wars, he more frequently used a carriage, not, as has been surmised, from any particular illness, but from feeling in a frame so constantly in exercise, the premature effects of age. The countenance of Napoleon is familiar to almost everyone from description, and the portraits which are found everywhere. The dark brown hair bore little marks of the attentions of the toilet. The shape of the countenance approached more than is usual in the human race to a square. His eyes were grey and full of expression, the pupils rather large, and the eyebrows not very strongly marked. The brow and upper part of the countenance was rather of a stern character. His nose and mouth were beautifully formed. The upper lip was very short. The teeth were indifferent, but were little shown in speaking. His smile possessed uncommon sweetness and is stated to have been irresistible. The complexion was a clear olive, otherwise in general colourless. The prevailing character of his countenance was grave, even to melancholy, but without any signs of severity or violence. After death, the placidity and dignity of expression, which continued to occupy the features, rendered them eminently beautiful, and the admiration of all who looked on them. Such was Napoleon's exterior. His personal and private character was decidedly amiable, excepting in one particular. His temper, when he received, or thought he received, provocation, especially if of a personal character, was warm and vindictive. He was, however, placable in the case even of his enemies, providing that they submitted to his mercy. But he had not that species of generosity which respects the sincerity of a manly and fair opponent. On the other hand, no one was a more liberal rewarder of the attachment of his friends. He was an excellent husband, a kind relation, unless when state policy intervened, a most affectionate brother. Arrived at the possession of supreme power, a height that dazzles and confounds so many, Napoleon seemed only to occupy the station for which he was born, to which his peculiar powers adapted him, and his brilliant career of success gave him, under all circumstances, an irresistible claim. He continued, therefore, with a calm mind and enlightened wisdom to consider the means of rendering his power stable, of destroying the republican impulse and establishing a monarchy of which he destined himself to be the monarch. To most men, the attempt to revive, in favour of a military adventurer, a form of government which had been rejected by what seemed the voice of the nation with universal acclaim, would have seemed an act of desperation. The partisans of the Republic were able statesmen 
and men of superior talent, accustomed also to rule the fierce democracy and organise those intrigues which had overthrown crown and altar, and it was hardly to be supposed that such men would, were it but for shame's sake, have seen their ten years' labour at once swept away by the sword of a young, though successful general. But Napoleon knew himself and them, and felt the confidence that those who had been associates in the power acquired by former revolutions must be now content to sink into the instruments of his advancement and the subordinate agents of his authority, contented with such a share of spoil as that with which the lion rewards the jackal. Whilst Napoleon destroyed successively every barrier of public liberty, while he built new state prisons and established a high police which filled France with spies and jailers, while he took the charge of the press so exclusively into his own hand, his policy at once and his egotism led him to undertake those immense public works of greater or less utility or ornament as the chance might be but which were sure to be set down as monuments of the emperor's splendour. The name given him by the working classes of the general undertaker was by no means ill-bestowed, but in what an incalculably greater degree do such works succeed when raised by the skill and industry of those who propose to improve their capital by the adventure than when double the expense is employed at the arbitrary will of a despotic sovereign. Yet it had been well if bridges, roads, harbours and public works had been the only compensation which Napoleon offered to the people of France for the liberties he took from them. But he poured out to them and shared with them to drown all painful and degradating recollections the intoxicating and fatal draught of military glory and universal domination to lay the whole universe prostrate at the foot of France, while France, the nation of camps, should herself have no higher rank than the first of her own emperor's slaves, was the gigantic project at which he laboured with such tenacious assiduity. It was the Sisyphean stone which he rolled so high up the hill that at length he was crushed under its precipitate recoil. The main objects of that immense enterprise were such as had been undertaken while his spirit of ambition was at its height, and no one dared, even in his councils, to interfere with the resolutions which he adopted. Had these been less eminently successful, it is possible he might have paused, and perhaps might have preferred the tranquil pursuit of a course which might have rendered one kingdom free and happy to the subjugation of all Europe but Napoleon's career of constant and uninterrupted success under the most disadvantageous circumstances, together with his implied belief in his destiny, conspired, with the extravagant sense of his own importance, to impress him with an idea that he was not in the role of common men, and induced him to venture on the most desperate undertakings, as if animated less by the result of reason than by an internal assurance of success. After great miscarriages, he is said sometimes to have shown a corresponding depression, and thence he resigned four times the charge of his army when he found his situation embarrassing, as if he no longer, feeling confidence in his own mind, or conceiving he was deserted for the moment by his guardian genius. In closing the life of Napoleon Bonaparte, we are called upon to observe that he was a man tried in the two extremities of the most exalted power and the most ineffable calamity. And if he occasionally appeared presumptuous when supported by the armed force of half a world, or unreasonably querulous when imprisoned within the narrow limits of St. Helena, it is scarce within the capacity of those whose steps have never led them beyond the middle path of life, to estimate 
either the strength of the temptations to which he yielded, or the force of mind which he opposed to those which he was able to resist.